are the core values of higher education and above and beyond disciplines that seem to have to do with the search for truth, that have to do with caring about evidence, that have to do with logic, and that have to do with reason generally. Now, I think I don't have a solution for this, but it seems quite reasonable for institutions of higher education to care about those standards and to see, again, we'll quote another, uh, this time it's Mark Twain, um, the trouble with the world is not that people know too little, but that they know so many things that ain't so. <laughs> so we live in a world where there has been a, it, this has always been the case, I mean, Mark Twain wasn't <laughs> born yesterday, but how this has been amplified by the, by the uh, information technology world within which we live, and therefore I have a, a concern that this focus on invited speakers, you know, uh, that has taken on these massive dimensions, and that we focus on it all the time, and we do have to think about it, and who should invite them, and, and what are different kinds of speech events, I'll get back to the speech events in a moment, is that we our students really need from us the tools of sourcing, the tools of evaluating and dealing with different media. They also need to learn the interpersonal skills of speaking, hearing, reading, all of those things that, you know, go with speech. So I want to try to suss out what's um, particularly salient about the theme of this panel now in 2019, because of course intellectual communities and academic fields have always enforced a kind of orthodoxy, as Keith points out in his book, um, uh, Carry Nation, the prohibition provocateur, touched off a near riot in Berkeley in 1903. Um, and some of you might know the incident where uh, E.O. Wilson had a pitcher of water dumped on his head at the American Anthropological Association in the mid-70s, maybe 1976, uh, for suggesting that human behavior might have biological underpinnings. So, um, so in some ways it's always um, been thus, but my question to, to each panel is I'm just trying to get sort of a, a read of the temperature here. Do you feel that the spectrum of ideas entering the academy has become more constrained? Um, and is, is, is therefore academic discourse actually more impoverished now than at some previous time? I think in part academia has to be committed to the idea um, that uh, it, it needs to be a porous system in which it's possible for people with dissenting views, uh, heterodox views, um, to enter into the academy, be successful in the academy, be able to mount research and teaching um, uh, questions that are outside the mainstream, uh, not only of American society more generally, but even of their own uh, disciplines, um, that we're not going to be able to progress if we, if we shut out um, those kinds of internal criticisms and dissenting voices uh, from the get-go. Um, at the same time, we're trying to enforce some real um, disciplinary constraints about how you go about uh, engaging in those processes. And moreover, locally, we may well find that it sometimes makes sense to specialize. Um, so I can easily imagine, for example, um, a, a single department uh, making decisions that we can't represent everybody in all kinds of views, even in our own uh, discipline. We're going to have to make some choices. Some things are going to be excluded uh, in order to focus our attention on some issues we think are particularly important, or in order to build a critical mass where we think we're going to get real synergies um, by speaking in that way. Um, but there's a danger that if every institution is making those kind of individualized choices, um, that globally we wind up shutting out um, uh, some voices that need to be able to make some space uh, within academia uh, more generally. Um, and how you go about the institutional process um, of managing that so that globally we're quite open, um, even if locally uh, we can be somewhat um, closed, I think is a real uh, difficulty. One thing I'll say I do worry about is <laughs> for someone in my position, 2014 is more or less when the most recent wave of this really sparked. To, to, it's kind of a mixed metaphor. Um, <laughs> but uh, what, what I do worry about is for kids that have only ever experienced this kind of climate, you begin, I mean, you would have no reason to think that it could be different. And therefore, you might have no reason to feel the impetus towards change. So that, that's one thing I do worry about. If, if this becomes, if, if, a, if a culture of self-censorship self becomes a norm and it's not uh, problematized and it's not, this, this is one way in which older generations are, you know, have a huge advantage and are extremely critical, which is 
you have the ability to remind young people what is possible, uh, what what might what was more true twenty years ago than than it is now, and what kind of values uh, we are blind to just by dint of the moment in which we were born. If if I could just add yeah. to uh, what Coleman said, that is kind of an argument. I think you are quite right in saying what students need to do, in the, what they students can do and need to do, but what you've just said is really a word on behalf of grown-ups. And that is to justify the fact that there are those of us that are actually uh, get, getting paid and others that are paying, so there should be something of value um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that we're contributing. And, and by the same token, when faculty members do not behave like grown-ups, but behave like trolls online, and instead of observing certain, how can we actually be teaching when we say these things? How is it different from what we might say over adult beverages in our living room, not online? Uh, I think that's a really major problem these days, is how a lot of faculty members behave online, which is not professional and not remotely grown up. I often feel that the, our administration can be led around by very small groups of students who are expert at taking offense. Mm -hmm. um, and are no seem to all know the chancellor's personal email address, um, and but at the same time they understand that we have a weakness as administrators that you know we have a vice chancellor for equity and inclusion it's part of our institutional value, and they know how to get our attention. Um, that tail can wag the dog constantly. We have a silent majority in our university, and I would imagine the same. The same is true for many of you. But still, Evan, you ignore them at your own risk mm -hmm. because they're the ones who are going to be camped out in front of the chancellor's house in a hunger strike. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who are going to turn to the media. Um, and they're a part of the community. Uh, and so there, it's a delicate balance. Um, and we're co you just need to constantly question yourself and find ways of understanding what the student body thinks. I would love to have some the resources to do polling every two, three days. What do you know? Where did you hear it from? What do you believe? Are we doing the right thing? We do it instead of just randomly like, oh, the chancellor got three emails and said, um, it's a huge problem that we actually don't know what the majority of our students think or how they're, you know, how they're receiving these things. You know, Berkeley is seen in a very stereotypical way. I have never, I've been there 15 years. I've never been to a protest where there were more than a thousand students out of 30,000. And so I remember being asked by a reporter once at one of those demonstrations, what's the administration thinking about today? And I said, we're thinking about the other 29,000, <laughs> right? But could we ignore those thousand? No, even though that was a tiny percentage of our student body. It's just a fact of life on a big public university. I think from uh, a conservative perspective, uh, there is an instinct now, I think I'm many on the right, uh, to be thinking about how should you uh, defund universities? How do you reduce the amount of funds uh, going into uh, universities because uh, the resources are supporting um, activities and speech that you find uh, inhospitable um, and, and disconcerting? Um, and I think one thing we want to be encouraging those on the right uh, to be thinking about um, is instead channeling more money. Uh, in the universities and channeling them uh, precisely in ways of trying to diversify um, speech. So rather than trying to shut down uh, departments and programs and speaker series and legal clinics um, that you don't like, um, instead find creative ways of funneling money uh, into programs and departments and centers and speaker series uh, that you find uh, more attractive. Um, so that ultimately what we all be trying to build is a pluralistic system um, in which uh, a, a multitude of voices are being heard um, on college campuses, a variety of different research programs um, and teaching programs are being pursued on campuses. And so rather than being concerned about how do we shrink that pot, um, how do we expand that pot and try to diversify um, that pot in various ways? Because I worry um, that we're now in a dynamic uh, in which um, those who are unhappy uh, with what's um, uh, going on in college campuses um, have decided that the way of dealing with that then um, is to simply starve um, uh, college campuses. And I think we're all going to be worse off if that's, if that's the dynamic that takes hold. So the question is who gets to decide? Uh, I think the colloquium model is we essentially poll the group. What do you guys want to talk about this week? So it's, it's a very natural process. And again, we don't have to, you don't have to wait 
to get the superstar professor uh, that's going to assign both sides of every issue. Uh, there are professors like that, but you don't have to wait, and it's very frustrating to wait if you're a student. It's f very frustrating to gamble on a professor you don't know that could end up changing your life or making your life hell for the next three months. Um, and you know, you also don't have to wait. You don't. We. I, I, I think. Uh, I think Dan said this before, right? It's not all about the speakers. The speakers are important, but in terms of the total time taken up learning and speaking and reading and writing, speakers coming to campus is a very small fraction of that. What matters more is the conversation conversations you're having with your peers. So again, I, I would harp on my theme, uh, act as if no one is coming to save you as students. Do it yourself. Um, uh, and the crucial thing to remember when you do that is that it is very, very, very easy to lapse into a war-like mindset. And that is the number one mistake that you can't make as a student group. It is not about battling with the clubs on campus that you feel are dogmatic with your own dogmas. And expect that urge to come. It's human. It's what we're built for. But th what you have to do is prize principles principles above your own natural urge to be combative and tribal.